problem solving of a fairly complex kind and learning of a fairly complex kind goes on completely outside of conscious awareness. That was Dr. Richard Nisbet, and you're listening to episode 281 of the Building Psychological Strength podcast, where we uncover the information, tools, and techniques to turn our mind into our most valuable asset. The courage to face fears with persistence. Being able to be present enough in this moment to choose my response thoughtfully. We have the strength to bend to life stressors, to bend to adversity without snapping, without breaking. There are only six things that contribute to our quality of life, and they are all experiences. In every moment, we are deciding who we want to be and how we want to live our lives. Noticing what your brain is doing and then being able to make choices. Mobilize the things that we know lift us up. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Building Psychological Strength podcast. My name is April, and I'm your host. This week is awesome. This is really exciting. You know, there's a lot of ways to judge the success of a podcast. You can judge it by downloads. You can judge it by reviews and ratings and how many, you know, average stars that a podcast gets. And this week, I'm judging my podcast by how awesome this guest is. This week, we are speaking with Dr. Richard Nisbet. If you have ever taken a Psych 101 course, even the most introductory psychology courses, you have likely learned about something called attribution theory. The way that we think about understanding the causes of our own behaviors versus other people's behaviors, things like that. Uh, We have this week on the podcast, the man who uncovered attribution theory, among other things. His contribution to the field, it cannot be overstated. Dr. Nisbet is one of the psychologists who maybe inhabits the top, I would say, three to five percent of psychologists whose work has been so influential in the field that, again, they make it into those Psych 101 courses because their work is so foundational and was so important to the field. And that's who we've got talking to us today. I'm geeking out, you guys. This was so great. I cited Dr. Nisbet's work in my work in graduate school. So we're in for a real treat this week because we're speaking to a man who has made a contribution to the field of psychology that very few other people can even come close to making in their career. To give you a little bit more background, Dr. Nisbet is the Theodore M. Newcomb Distinguished University Professor of Psychology Emeritus at the University of Michigan and one of the world's most respected psychologists. He received the Award for Distinguished Scientific Contributions from the American Psychological Association and many other national and international awards. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he is here this week to talk to us about his newest book, Thinking, a Memoir. This episode is really interesting because, yes, we're talking about a memoir of his. He's really giving a background on himself as a human being, his career from really a behind-the-scenes look, but he also talks about a lot of this important work of his, again, from this behind-the-scenes view. You get to see in this book how he developed these theories and the the process he took of just learning a little bit and then making another hypothesis and learning a little bit more and then making another guess and I guess hypothesis and learning a little bit more from there. It was such a great read for someone who has been in the field for so long like I have to see how all of this came to fruition. This conversation on the podcast this week is also very interesting because We have the godfather of all of this amazing work here to talk to us about how this comes into play in our day-to-day lives. So we talk about everything from, we have an amazing conversation about the difference between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. You know I love that stuff. And how powerful the unconscious is and how we don't use it to its full potential. 
Great conversation there. We have a great conversation about how we can be more accurate in terms of how we make decisions and uh, think about information and really think about the causes and effects of different, say, data that we might take in during our lives and the impact this has on our life experience and our own behavior. This is such a rich conversation, you guys, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Nisbet on the podcast. He also mentions another book of his that is called Mind uh, Mindware, Tools for Smart Thinking. If you're interested in that book or this most recent book, Thinking a Memoir, I have those both linked up in this show notes description or this episode description. So if you want to check those out, you can go ahead and click those links and take a peek. I'm so absolutely thrilled to introduce this episode. I hope you all enjoy this conversation with Dr. Richard Nisbet as much as I did. Dr. Richard Nisbet, you are, I can't believe you're on this show. I'm so excited. It's absolutely thrilling to get to feature you and the work that you've done in the field of psychology on the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. This is really exciting. I want to spend, I don't typically do this with guests where we spend a chunk of, a little chunk of time in the actual interview section of our time together talking about who you are. But there's a chance that some folks in this audience won't realize how big of a deal it is that we have you here on this podcast. So I want to talk a little bit about your background and your contribution to the field. Can you give us like the Cliff's Notes version of what you studied and researched throughout your career? And then I'm going to definitely add some color commentary because uh, there is... Um, just an experience that I've had as growing up in the field of psychology and studying the field of psychology and seeing your work that is kind of an outsider's uh, perspective that I think is useful as well. So tell us a little bit about the research that you did throughout your career. Well, I focused on uh, reasoning in one way or another. Almost everything I've done is about reasoning. Um, and uh, almost everything I've done about reasoning is to show the errors that people <laughs> make in reasoning. Uh, and after I've been doing that for 15 years or so, uh, and I'm always saying, look, these errors that we make, they're incorrigible. I mean, you can't get better about them. They're just wired into our intuitive understanding of the world. But I never tested that. So, okay, I'm going to prove that. So I started out to see if you could teach concepts like the law of large numbers or statistical regression, or uh, uh, correlation, uh, or the uh, gold standard research, uh, and why it is the gold standard. Uh, so I, I started teaching those things in uh, very brief classes, I mean, 15 or 20 minutes, and found that these concepts, which are part of the armamentarium of science, certainly of psychology, um, you can teach them 15 or 20 minutes and change people's lives. I mean, it's it's amazing. Uh, and so then I started looking at, well, is the education system doing any good? I mean, I went through the education system and got convinced that all these kinds of errors that people were making um, can't be corrected. So, uh, so I found that college education really does make you smart in lots of ways, which we can talk about at some point if you're interested. But so that's uh, that's uh, two major focuses of my uh, research. Uh, another is on the conscious mind, what goes on there, and how much access we have to it. And the flip side of that, what goes on in the unconscious mind. Uh, and I, just as we were talking earlier before the show, it occurred to me that we tend to put way too much emphasis on the conscious mind. I think it's we think it's doing much more of the work for us than it really is. And we, we drastically underestimate how effective the un unconscious mind is and how much of the work it's doing. And consequently, we don't make nearly as much use of it as we could. So those are the main things. And then I'll just say toward the end, uh, the end of my research career on reasoning, uh, I looked at um, cultural differences in reasoning to find that there are drastic differences between the way East Asians and Westerners reason. So that's it in a nutshell. 
Amazing. The bit of color color commentary that I want to add to that, which there's so many places that we can dive in and I'm so excited about it, but is that your work, if, if you've taken, if you're listening to this and you've taken an introductory psychology class, you have read work that you did work that you contributed to the field. And that's not something that probably 95% of psychologists can say researchers, their work isn't a big enough contribution, a foundational enough contribution that it makes it into psych 101 textbooks, but yours did stuff like attribution theory and that type of thing. We learn that in the most basic psych classes because it was so groundbreaking and so foundational. So I say that because I want this audience to understand who you're hearing from today. When we dive into these topics and start to talk about how they impact our lives, you're hearing from one of the most well-researched, widely cited psychologists that's pretty much where you end that sentence, like pretty much that, the mo- one of the most well-cited psychologists ever, which is really great. Where I want to dive in actually is, is with the conscious and the unconscious mind. This is something that there's a lot in psychology that gets um, interwoven with sort of pop culture and um, you know mainstream media. You walk through the bookshelves of Barnes and Noble and you'll see some books that are actually evidence and research based around the topics and others that are very much not. So there's a lot of misconception out there. Can you start us off by talking about what are those two sides of our mind? What do they each do? Or just give us like the 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 real information on that so that we're all jumping off from a solid place. Sure. Uh, well, actually, one of the very first, I think literally the first study I ever did was on attribution, which you mentioned. Um, I had people take a steady, steady series of electric shocks, and I told them I wanted to see what was the effect of a pill uh, on their uh, perception of these shocks. And I wanted them to tell me when they could first feel the shock, when it first became painful, uh, and when it became too painful to continue. And some of the subjects, I gave a pill, which we call suproxen, which would cause, we told them, uh, a heart rate increase, breathing irregularity, maybe sweaty palms, the symptoms that you get when you're taking electric shock, the arousal. Because <laughs> you're nervous. Right, right. Uh, so uh, the theory was uh, people will start to take the shock and it, it's pretty arousing. And they notice, well, I'm really worked up about this. And say, oh, but that pill, I took that pill and that's what's causing it. And so the subjects who thought the pill was, being, was causing their symptoms would take more shock than people who were given a, a sugar pill. It was always a sugar pill, nothing in it, uh, who just given a bunch of junk symptoms that don't uh, cause, uh, correspond to any pill. Uh, so sure enough, the subjects who had taken a pill, which they thought would cause arousal, took four times the amperage of the other subjects. So <laughs> it was an enormous effect. I mean, uh, I mean just almost no overlap. So at that time, it was understood that, you know, people, the conscious mind was what was doing the work for everything. And so I wanted to get some nice quotations from people about saying, yeah, doc, I mean, I started to get worked up over the shock. And then I realized it was nothing like that. And when I asked them, how come they took so much? I said, you took a lot of shock. I mean, more than most people, how come? Uh, And they would say something like, well, you know, I used to work on radios and I would get electric shocks and that I said, oh, okay. Uh, And I would keep questioning. Finally, give them the theory. I said, I thought you were going to think that the arousal was due to the pill. And so you'd take more shock. And they said, oh, you know, that's, uh, I'll I'll bet that's true for a lot of people, Doc. Um, But see, I used to work on radios. Um, (laughs) And that started me off saying, my God, people don't know what the hell goes on in their heads. So we started doing studies on that. And I'm going to tell you about two studies, which are slightly more complicated than the others. And they're not mine, but they are so incredibly telling. In one study, an experimenter has two ropes hanging down from the ceiling. 
and he tells the subject, your job is to tie those two ropes together. And they're too short to tie together, but the, the laboratory is strewn with all kinds of different materials, and there's lots of ways you can solve it, like tying an extension cord to one of them and hanging on the other. And after the subject has been stumped for a while, the experimenter casually flips one of the ropes and puts it into motion, sets it swinging. Then typically within 45 seconds, the subject ties a pair of pliers or something to one of the ropes, sets it swinging like a pendulum, runs over the other rope, catches the pendulum and ties them together. And then the experiment says, that's very clever. And what, what made you think of that? And uh, I don't know, it was, it was just the only thing left. Uh, what some of his subjects were psychologists, psychologists, and they gave very rich accounts. One of them said, "Oh, uh, I, I thought of swinging across a river. I had imagery of monkeys swinging on vines and trees. That occurred simultaneously with the solution." That's totally how we would answer. P.S. That's how that's psychologists right. That's right. would answer. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I, but very, very, he believed it. He, undoubtedly, he believed it. I mean. Um, he probably did have that imager and have no idea that he had the imager because of what the experimenter did. Um, so um, then he asks, he asks people why they didn't, virtually no one, no one ever gave it actually, the, the, the true account. And when he asked people, do you suppose the swinging pendulum had any effect? The great majority of them said no. Um, so that's, you know, this study, by the way, was done 90 years ago. <laughs> uh, so when I started doing my work on the unconscious, it wasn't really news. Uh, it just was the most thorough work that had been done. The other study is also astonishing. You show subjects uh, a, a monitor that's uh, a matrix of four squares, empty squares, uh, and you put an X in one of those squares. And and you ask the subjects to predict where the next X will appear. Well, they know nothing at this point, so it's blind guessing. But in fact, there is an extremely complicated set of rules which determine where the X will appear. So an X never appears in uh, a, a box, a square, that it's pre just previously appeared in. It never appears in the lower right until it's appeared in the upper left twice in a row. I mean, it's just incredibly complicated experience. But people learn. They go from total chance to doing pretty darn well. <laughs> so uh, then uh, he he throws game into arrears, throws away the rules, a new set of rules, and the subject's performance completely falls apart. Uh, and after they've been screwing around embarrassedly for a while, he says, gee, you were doing so well there, and, and then... Uh, you weren't doing so well. Why do you suppose it is? And they'd say things like, oh, I just lost the rhythm. Uh, and you'd say, <laughs> did you think there were any rules? Oh, no, it's just all random stuff. So they had no idea that they were, they have learned an ex a complex set of rules. So uh, problem solving of a fairly complex kind and learning of a fairly complex thing goes on completely outside of conscious awareness. And by the way, almost everything too <laughs> does as well. I mean, we, we can always tell stories uh, and, and we're not making it, well, we are making it up. We just don't realize that we're making it up. So that's the, the role of the unconscious and our failure to recognize the conscious mind what's going on. This is a great example of something that I jokingly say, but it's it's grounded in exactly this. This is where it came from, is I just look at us sometimes as a species and I'm like, we are just adorable that we make it through a day. I mean, it is just adorable that we think that we have as much control or as much awareness or as much free will, or I mean, you can name whatever thing you want to name right. when we have such powerful forces operating underneath the, you know, underneath our level of awareness, yet we think that somehow we're in control and we right. believe those stories that we're telling ourselves. Right. We it's, think we're, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It's just wild. 
yeah, we, we think we're in control. We think we know what happened. But after we did our work showing that if even things like judgments like which is the best set of, uh, of nylon stockings we have four in a row, and we find that people will choose the last object that they saw as the best four times as frequently as the first thing they saw. But try asking them, oh, excuse me, but do you suppose your judgment of the quality of those stockings was influenced by the position and the array? I mean, they'll, they'll volunteer to punch you out. I mean, that's, <laughs> you think I can't tell the difference? I mean, so uh, after we've uh, done you know, that kind of work showing that uh, people are making choices, they're choosing their behavior, they're solving problems, it's all outside of awareness. Now, often we're correct, of course. I mean, you know, I know that I swerved to avoid the squirrel. I know that I gave at the office because everybody else was. It's common, ordinary situations that we, we learn why we do things. But if it's a, a unique situation, X is in the different quadrants or it's, uh, pendulums uh, and uh, or if it's a unique situation, the necessary cognitive processes are going on, but we have no access to them. Uh, so, and that gets to the second part of my story, which is here's the unconscious that's doing all this work, and that's great. It doesn't really matter that much that we don't know why we do what we do, uh, although it would probably be better off in some ways. What's important is that it gets done but what we don't know about the unconscious is that it can, it's, it not only is it doing most of the work, but it could do a lot more work if we just tried to. Interesting. And, yeah. Okay. We need to go there in just a minute. I want to highlight one other thing that I think we were getting close to and would love to get your thoughts on. So you're talking about these situations that are very commonplace, right? We're in a situation where, you know, we're, we're very familiar. We've been in that position before. We've made that decision, done that behavior, whatever it is, lots before. And then we get into these novel ones with, you know, ropes hanging from the ceiling. And oh, this just takes me back to my grad school days. And these poor people who had to do my studies, we were just, we're just awful to people in social psych, especially, but Anyway, so thank you to anybody who's ever been a sophomore in college and has taken Absolutely. a psychologist study. Bless really, their heart. Hi, man. We appreciate it. I hope you got a lot of extra credit for it. Right. <laughs> anyway, we you get put in these novel situations that are new. Is it that your mind is doing its best job to apply an unconscious process that it learned in another domain that might be a little similar to this new weird position you're finding yourself in. So it's sort of doing its best job to figure out how to guide your action. Is that what's happening there when we're in these novel situations and, you know, the unconscious is taking over? Right. That, that sounds right for a lot of the kinds of work we've done that, that people are, um, are drawing on something that they already know and they don't realize that they're applying it in this particular situation. That's that's a lot of it, I'm sure. Yeah, that's really interesting. It This is not a rabbit hole we should go down necessarily, but it makes me think about um, the impact for innovation and creativity as we're pulling from things that we're familiar in these, you know, potentially very diverse, different circumstances and applying it to something new. That's really interesting. Well, um, I can comment on that. If yeah, you like. actually, yes. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very glad that you mentioned the uh, question of creativity. Um, I read a long time ago, I read a book by a man named Brewster Giesel. That's G-H-I for any of your readers who might want to read it. It's about the creative process. He's got dozens of essays by people who, uh, I mean, great people, great scientists and great artists. And he says, Almost in no case but one does anyone ever claim that their great idea came to the conscious mind. Uh, ah. it, was, it was the result of conscious work, which they were tracking as they were thinking. It just pops into their head. And uh, so Juan Carre, the mathematician, says, you know, the minute I put my foot 
uh, on the bus to go on my vacation, it popped into my head that the transformation functions that I needed were ones I had already used for X power. Or, and my, one of my favorites is by the poet Amy Lowell, who saw um, uh, a sculpture of bronze horses in a gallery. And she thinks to herself, gee, that might make a, a nice poem sometime. So she puts it, files it away. Six months later, not having thought previously in that whole time about the bronze horses, she starts taking by dictation, <laughs> as it were, the, the poem. And she says, it was there. I mean, so mm -hmm. it's been going on unconsciously all along. And the main thing I want to tell your readers, the main useful thing, is make use of the unconscious because we don't do nearly as much, make nearly as much use of it as we should. You've got to prime the unconscious. You've got to, uh, so uh, in my case, if I'm trying to come up with good thought questions, if I sit down just before the class and write out the thought questions, they're not going to be that great. If several days before the class, I say, gee, I've got to come up with thought questions. And then I'm thinking about it, then, then I sit down having primed myself to think about thought questions and start writing them. They're, they're much, much better yeah. than they would have been. So I tell students, you know, you ask yourself, what's the, the best time to start working on a paper that's due at the end of the term? And the answer is the first day of class. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you'll find a lot of the work is done for free by the unconscious. Here's where this is cool. And I don't want people to miss the connection here with something that you said earlier in the interview. You mentioned you've got these people who are looking at these ropes, right? And they're trying to figure out how they figured out how to get them tied together. Or, you know, what was it that caused my decision-making in any of these cases? And they name all these other random things. And you say, well, okay, the pill though, didn't you attribute your heart rate to the pill? And that's why you just assumed, oh, no, I'm fine. I can keep going with these electric shocks and you just keep just keep hammering me. And they say, well, that I could see why that's the case for other people, but not me. We think we somehow are not subject to these occurrences that you're talking about, this influence of the unconscious mind, we think it doesn't apply to us, but definitely applies to everyone else. Right. And I don't want people to miss that because it applies. If you're a human with a brain, it applies right. to you. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You mentioned heat earlier. And my favorite prime experiment is you have people hold a glass of iced tea or hold a warm cup of coffee Coffee while they rate other people's personality. And if they're holding a glass of ice, they think this guy is he's a little cold, actually, this guy. They're holding a warm cup of coffee. He's, he's a warm, sort of person, I think. So the, the prime, in this case, is actual temperature. And that, and that has a metaphorical effect because it, it jumps from the physical to uh, to the psychological, uh, and uh, so it's a it's a very striking example of a, of a prime. I have this crazy set of hypotheses, so uh, and I have I have the man here to ask about my crazy set of hypotheses, and I don't think you've done this study specifically, but we'll just like maybe allow the ship to leave the shore a little bit and do some educated guessing. There are, um, there are uh, topics in more mainstream literature. You can go to Barnes & Noble and get books on these all the time about things like feng shui and things like the law of attraction, You like this book, The Secret and whatever. And people have beliefs about the mechanism through which they think feng shui, quote, works, the mechanism through which they think the law of attraction works works. Are you familiar with both of those things? Have you Certainly seen them? Familiar with feng shui. What is the law of attraction? Law of attraction is this belief. Folks who are more into this than I am just know, like, I'm going to give the quick uh, explanation. There's this belief that the things that we think about um, magnetically attract 
those uh, similar occurrences or outcomes. So if I think thoughts and have feelings and emotions that are in line with prosperity, I'm more likely to make money in the future. I have this belief that I'm going to take all of the mechanisms off the table through which those folks who are proponents of those phenomenon would say that they work, take it all off the table. I believe what's actually happening from a psychological perspective is priming. My belief is that, or my hypothesis, I'm not going to even say belief because if somebody proved me wrong, I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. I'm wrong. So I can't say that I necessarily believe it. My hypothesis is that by setting up our space in a certain way that is pleasing or that sparks more joy, to use a Marie Kondo reference, we tend to feel better in that space because we're primed to feel that way. I also believe, and your point about the writing a research paper is an interesting one because it's related to this, that if we set a goal and we get really clear on what that goal is, and we just keep revisiting it and just keep, you know, mentally, cognitively touching back on that goal, we're more likely to, through a lot of cognitive, other cognitive biases, seek out, find, believe, notice information, occurrences, data, people, opportunities that are in line with that goal. I think a ton of it is priming that's happening with folks I'm I'm not going to argue against whatever mechanisms that people in those fields want to say that they are cuz I don't care. I think there's a ton about priming in our day-to-day lives that can impact how we feel our, our achievement of goals, the types of things that we'll go after and do and how comfortable we feel with them. I don't know. I just went on a tirade, but I would love your thoughts on that. Educated guesses even. Yeah, I, I, that's plausible to me. That, that's a plausible mechanism that you're thinking about these things and so you see them or you create environments in which they're more likely to happen because you're thinking things that would, uh, would do that. So it's, it's quite plausible to me uh, that these kinds of priming things would work. One of my uh, favorite priming studies related to prosperity if, if somebody finds uh, a quarter in a phone booth um, and then there's someone, just as they're coming out of the phone booth, drops their books and papers on the ground, they're more likely to help the person. Mm. Um, so they, they've been put into a good mood. Uh, they're thinking pleasant thoughts. And so they're going to do a pleasant thing. Um, so uh, certainly the, the kind of, Priming that you're talking about is is a candidate for uh, law of attraction. Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting, and it's it's uh, what I always love to do with this show is bring things back to what does this mean for you day to day? And I think there's a couple of places that we can go, but this unconscious mind piece about setting up your environment in a way that primes the things you want it to prime, and doesn't prime things that you maybe don't want to be thinking about or processing or experiencing all the time. Mm-hmm. I think there's something real there about it. I, the, the joking little example I can give is my little desk here. I started COVID at a desk that I hated and I hated my setup and I hated everything about it. And everything here has been selected intentionally. There are memories and emotions and things associated with it. And I feel good sitting at this desk now. Just the same things that you didn't like and you've come to like, or there you've put different things. Totally different things. I've removed them. They were things that I had that had some association, some affect associated with them, something I got them in a place that was, you know, a great vacation or a beautiful hike or something like that. And they're close to me. And I think there's a priming aspect to that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the most important studies I know, it's not quite a knockdown finding, but I certainly believe it. And it's, um, and that is somebody looked at um, uh, public housing 
projects in Chicago and looked at crime rates associated with those. And some of the uh, housing projects were surrounded by vegetation, trees, flowers, plants, and some it was just asphalt and concrete mm -hmm. as far as the eye could see. The crime rate was double in the, those environments, what it was mm -hmm. in environments with vegetation. I, and I, you know, it, it's completely plausible to me. I mean, in my environment, I know it has a huge effect on me. So I spent a lot of effort um, like you do with your desk. I mean, I have a garden wherever I live. I mean, mm -hmm. Uh, working in the garden is pleasant. Looking at the garden, and it's, it, I have no doubt that it makes me uh, a happier and possibly more agreeable person uh, to be surrounded in beauty. I love it. There's you recently released a book called Thinking. It's a memoir. And it was so interesting from a number of perspectives. As somebody who's studied in the field, it was really cool to just go review your contribution to the field, but from almost like a backstage view of it. It was also fun to get to know you as uh, a kid who, uh, God bless your parents, you were a bit mischievous as a kid a little bit irreverent throughout your career. That was fun to see. Um, it's just a really cool book. But what I think is interesting about it is it, and just from, again, this practical standpoint, it gives us an idea of ways that we can be um, better thinkers, more rational, logical thinkers, more accurate thinkers. Can you give a couple of tips about how people can... Um, do that better, be a little bit less biased, maybe be a little bit more logical. Right. Well, it turns out um, that when you, uh, you can teach people a statistical, probabilistic concept like the law of large numbers, and it affects the way they think about an infinite range of possibilities, which astonished me to find that that's true. Let me give an example of the kind of thing that statistics training will do for you. If you ask a University of Michigan student, first year student, first day of class, you say, you know, you probably know that um, every baseball season, uh, early on, there are always some batters with averages of 450 or higher batting averages, but no one's ever finished the season with such a high average. Why do you suppose that is? The student's probably gonna say something like, well, you know, the pitchers make the necessary adjustments or, you know, the guys get cocky and they start screwing around. If they get a <laughs> University of Michigan education, at the end of four years, you ask other students that same question. They say, well, you know, there are not that many at bats early on the season, of course, and uh, it's not going to be so unusual to find you know, somebody very, very high or very, very low, but they're not going to sustain that over the long haul. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, that some people will give you, you know, very lovely answers like, you know, listen, first time at that, uh, your average is either zero or one. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> ever finished the season with either of those averages. Yes. So, uh, and if they've had a psychology education, they're, I mean, it's psychology students who gave all kinds of problems, statistics and probability um, and uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis um, and uh, regression effects, multiple regression type of statistical analysis. Uh, at the end of an, a psychology uh, degree, they do 70% better mm. on these tests. Their everyday life events, uh, nothing unusual about them, but the things they've learned uh, in school have a, a massive effect. And English literature, I'm sorry, it doesn't do anything for you. And physical sciences, it doesn't do anything for you. No probability in statistical yeah, training. No probability of statistics. Now, for whatever reason, and I have no idea why this is true, because I, if you look at logic, uh, Psychology students don't get better. They don't get more logical. Sociology students don't get more logical. 
literature students and physical science students do become more logical. Interesting. Uh, don't ask me why. Uh, it's a kind of compensation prize. <laughs> I can see how that would apply to other psychologists, but that didn't apply to me. I'm just no. kidding. Right. Sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And to your point, I almost got kicked out of a casino one time because my friend who was in my psychology program with me, we went to the the roulette table and they gave us a sheet of paper to keep track of which numbers the ball had fallen on. And one of us said, I don't remember which one said, oh, that doesn't matter. Each role is a mutually exclusive event. And I seriously thought we were going to be escorted out. So don't ever say that in a casino. They don't like people who have statistical training. I'm like, we're still going to give you our money and play the game. But yeah, I was not impressed. So the, the, the hypothesis was it's rigged so that if, if uh, 36 comes up, it's not going to come up again for another 200 tries. That's what most people think. I think that's why they give you the sheet of paper to keep track of it. That somehow it's unlikely to come up again because it's come up the time before. It was hilarious. So anyway, yeah. yeah. So it can benefit you, but you can also get kicked out of casinos for it. Right. Fortunately, I've never been kicked out of a casino. <laughs> they let you stay. I can think of other places that just soon not have me. But. Sure. <laughs> That's awesome. I love the you've done such an amazing um, amount of research. You've done research in an area that's so applicable to professional lives, people's relationships. I mean, just how they interact with the world and and the experience that they have. You know, we're the Building Psych Strength podcast. I ask everybody what their definition of psychological strength is, and in the context of the work that you've done. You know, I think this reasoning and logic side of things is so applicable to it. I'd love to understand what that looks like from your perspective. What does it look like to be strong in the area that you have researched? Well, what I've focused on is scientific reasoning, including probabilistic thinking, statistical thinking, uh, microeconomics, meaning choice, uh, and, um, and, it, and you're better off if you know these concepts and have some idea about how to apply them in everyday life. It really, it really does um, make us smarter. I know that there are mistakes I don't make because you know, I know the law of large numbers uh, or uh, I know the concept of statistical regression. Um, I also know that there are a lot of mistakes I make because I violate those rules, <laughs> but I'm more likely I think to realize afterwards. One of the mistakes that I make, this principle of statistical regression is simply that if you observe an event that's extreme, odds are the next time around that you observe an event of that type, it's not going to be as extreme. So a kind of problem we give to test people's understanding of regression is we say, uh, I have a friend uh, who's um, manufacturer representative and she does a lot of traveling and she loves she's something of a gourmet she goes to any good restaurant she serves is good and she finds any time she goes to a restaurant which is really fabulous when she goes back to that restaurant again it's typically not as good and again your university of michigan friend says what you ask why does that happen say well you know her expectations are too high and they can only be disappointed all kinds of causal explanations. Somebody who's had a couple of years of statistics will say, well, you know, stupendous meals, those are really rare. I mean, uh, and think about it. Uh, how many restaurants are there which where you can get a stupendous meal every now and then versus restaurants where you'll get a stupendous meal every single damn time? And they said, no. Many more restaurants are the first type. So if we got a stupendous meal, it's probably at a restaurant which that's the best they can do, and they're not in general not doing that well. All of that is dictated by the simple principle of regression that extreme events are less likely to recur because there are more non-extreme events out there than there are extreme events by definition. Yep. So if you understand that concept, it, it affects the way you understand all kinds of things, and it. It makes you less disappointed. It doesn't prevent me, by the way, if I if I get a student who's absolutely fantastic, 
you know, I said, this is the next Amos Tversky. <laughs> and it never is. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't, how did I get that wrong? <laughs> so you never, you never completely you know, understand any statistical principle in such a way that it's going to inoculate you against error. You're I love off. it. I love it. Well, statistics and probability has completely shaped my career in, I don't know, more ways than I could even describe. And I'm sure, well, I know it does come into play with how I think about uh, information, sources of information, how I process things for sure, sometimes to a fault. Um, but that's a really great tip and a really way, great way to think about things, especially in a world where we have so much information coming at us from so many different sources. It's yeah. such a great um, reminder. Can you tell people a bit, um, tell people about your book? Where can they get it? I've read it. It's awesome. Um, help direct people to this book that uh, so they can get their hands on it. Uh, uh, well, it's available. Uh, I have a website at Amazon. So you just go to Amazon, say Nisbet, and all my books will come up. Not all of which are equally interesting, I can assure <laughs> But this particular book, uh, is, I, people are finding it uh, to be interesting. A couple of a, a book, people are interested in the kinds of things I was saying about reasoning errors and so on and statistical training. I have a whole book about how you can get smarter by uh, applying particular statistical principles, economic principles, and so on. It's called Mindware. Um, and then other books, which, uh, which I've written are on there. And it, if it's not in the first half dozen, you probably don't want to read it. <laughs> I love it. I'll make sure that I link up uh, those books in the show notes. So if you're listening to this and you're interested, you should be able to just swipe up on your device and click on the link in the show notes description to be able to be taken directly to your book. This has been awesome. It's such a huge uh, pleasure for me. You know, you I've been podcasting for almost five years now, and there's a lot of ways to judge the success of a podcast. You can look at downloads. You can look at numbers of reviews. You can look at how many episodes or how regular does somebody post. You can judge yourself in a lot of different ways. But um I judged it as a pretty good measure of success to be reached out to by somebody who has made as big of a contribution as you have and somebody whose name is so recognizable in the field. So this has been a complete pleasure for me. It's been the highlight of my week. I'm so excited to have been able to feature you and dive deeper into some of these topics that have been so formative for me as a psychologist. So thank you so much for being here. I so appreciate it. This has been amazing. Thank you. I had a great time. It's a simple fact that nearly everyone in the world could benefit from building psychological strength, but not everyone will put in the time and effort to do so. But today you did. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Building Psychological Strength. Now, if you're interested in building the mental toughness, confidence, and resilience you need to thrive through life's ups and downs, visit us at www.peakmindpsychology.com. Also, if there's someone in your life who could benefit from this episode, please share it with them. And if you yourself found this episode valuable, meaning if you took away even one insight that you can use to build psychological strength in your own life, we would so appreciate it if you would drop us a rating and a review on iTunes. The thing is, the more ratings and reviews we have, the easier it is to get this powerful and important content out to the people who need to hear it. Remember, your mind can be your most valuable asset or your biggest liability, and you get to choose. So choose wisely, my friend, and I'll see you next time on Building Psychological Strength.